were really pleased when we listened during the intervention, your participation on the 16th of December 2007 in Uniterra. We want to ask you, why did you accept to come to this first international colloquia in memoria and Desiree? What was really in your mind when you said uh, Comisión Sexta, Contra Historia, Suni Tierra, yes, I will be there? Well, I had followed the Zapatista movement from, from its beginning. Uh, and um, I read uh, about it, I read quite a lot of the communiques of Marcos. Um, a few years ago he and I exchanged letters. Um, uh, and I, I knew that the Zapatismo movement was, had a global significance. Um, because of my political understanding of what was happening in the world. My, my detailed understanding of what was happening here, I can't tell you anything about, you know much more than I do, but, but I, I, I followed. So, uh, um, when, when I got an invitation uh, to come um, through Fernanda, but from Marcos, um, I said, I have to go. Um, in fact, I was going to go at this moment back to Palestine, where I go quite frequently, um, um, but I cancelled it um, to come here. Um, and of course, I don't regret it. Um, I have learned so much. Um, if you ask me what I've learned, um, in, a, in, in a certain sense I could tell you better in a few months, <laughs> uh, um, because because I am so full of impressions um, and uh, arguments and uh, ideas, but also also so full of another kind of conviviality, um, which maybe is the most precious thing of all. Um, yeah, we know that you appreciate that because when you read your paper and you talked to us, it was like a, the whole audience was in shock listening to you. I mean, and you started your intervention, your participation, seeing, saying something like, see beyond the words. And then after that, you told us, imagination connects people. We want to ask you, if that is your idea, how the Zapatista movement is linked to all your own imagination? What in personal terms links you with the Zapatistas and at this um, kind of imagination, narratives, images? What is really inside John Berger that links in the basic, basic level you and the Zapatistas? Well, imagination um, is what allows us to uh, lend ourselves to the other. Um, this is not a very, this is a very obvious thing. I mean, if you just have to watch small children playing, uh, they may be playing with a stone, they, uh, they may be playing with a, a piece of cloth, uh, or they may be talking to, playing with a real live animal. And, and you immediately see that their imagination is able um, to make them come out from themselves and uh, follow the existence and the movements of another. And it seems to me that that is what imagination is. 
imagination is not in uh, inventing architecture with columns like that. Uh, uh, I mean, imagination is volatile and is always connected with with life, uh, and that means with other lives. Um, um, but it also can be in relation to a flower. Um, um, sure. Or, or the way that uh, the wind uh, moves a tree. Um, all right, if, and then if we go further, uh, I mean, one of the really important things, it seems to me, about the writings of Subcomandante Marcos um, is his language because he has created, uh, or he, well, he has created, uh, that's not perhaps quite true, but he is the mouth yeah. uh, of a language, mm -hmm. uh, which is a political language, but it is a political language incredibly connected uh, with imagination in the sense that I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and it, what does that do? Amongst other things, it connects the political and the global, the planet, with intimacy. Um, and in, in, in European culture, uh, these are two absolutely distinct categories. There is the intimate, uh, and, then, and then there is the public, mm -hmm. uh, or the political. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a wall between them. Mm -hmm. um, there is no such wall with you. Uh, um, yeah. Exactly in that direction, some uh, comrades wanted to ask, what do you think about Elias Contreras? This uh, Elias Contreras, you know this uh, personaje who is always talking about uh, La Comisión de Investigación. Have you heard of him, Elias Contreras? Yes, but no, just like that. On, only like that? Yes, yes. Only like that. But explain to me and maybe I can answer. Oh, yeah. Elias Contreras is a, a character, yeah. a personaje from the Intrinsic Movement. Yeah. Uh, it's a novel. Of the novel for the commandante y Patrimonio Estrella. Yes, yes. La novela se llama Muertos Incómodos. Have you heard about the novel that Paco Ignacio Taibo and Marcos wrote together? Yes. In a dialogue? Yes, y yes, yes, but I mean, I know about it, but I have not read it uh, because I've, I haven't had it in English. Uh -huh. uh, so, I mean, I know about it, uh -huh. um, but I can't really talk about it. I'm sorry. Ma no, that's okay. Maybe we can go uh, deeper into the writing of this collective mouth that it has a name, Subcomandante Marcos. Yes. I mean, in the wonderful way you describe, because sometimes it's very difficult for mestizos or anti-Zapatistas or non-Zapatistas um, to understand that there is a collective sentiment and is a collective word, because we are so used to see the face and the person, and that person is an individual, and in our Western societies, an individual is an individual. It can be a collective voice, mouth, then could you go deeper into this idea? Why you don't see just a man, an individual in Marcos? Okay. Um. Of course. I mean, when um, when European thought talks about the collective, um, they it immediately uh, well, of course, it is frightened of the collective uh, for, for for many reasons. But but if for a moment we try to understand their point of view, they think of a committee okay. uh, and committees normally um, are uh, um, uncreative. I mean, or anyway, yes, they are unc uh, they are, and, and if they function, they function by a continual um, 
process of okay, I, I make a compromise here, you make a compromise there, uh, and finally uh, we, we, we maybe we will be able to put a few pieces together to which we all agree, and that that's that. Mm -hmm. well, and this is the most uncreative process imaginable. <laughs> yeah? Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and if we talk about the collective and the collective imagination, in a certain sense, this is something which goes beyond words and sometimes comes before words. And it is, it is a often silent, mutual sense of sharing, um, which is often communicated simply by a glance. Uh, um, even when something isn't happening, and when there is something happening, uh, which is dramatic, um, it, it, it intensifies. Um, uh, yes, so the, I think the most important thing to say there is that, it, that this imagination is before words. Um, um, it is something which is behind words. Um, and I can, ex I can maybe explain that better mm -hmm. if I just for one moment talk about translation. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when a text is being translated, mm -hmm. um, it can be poetry, it can be an incantation, or, or, it, or it can be a story. Or, uh, okay, people think, can I take yeah, your paper yeah, for a yeah, moment? Yeah, okay. People think that, okay, here, here are the words written in one language, and here is this is the language I'm translating to, and you you take this word or that sentence, those words, and then you put them into the words of this language. And it's like that, mm -hmm. and this is completely false. Uh, many translations are made like that, but the soul of the uh, is lost mm -hmm. because it isn't a binary uh, thing. It is not. Is not either or, mm -hmm. um, because what happens really with the translation is that, okay, here is the original text, yeah. and you read it, and you take it in, and then you try to see what is behind that, mm -hmm. and what was there before the words were written, mm. what made those words be written, mm. with what asked for those words to be written, Yes, and, mm -hmm. and this is something which is perhaps you can't put into words. Mm -hmm. You can only feel it, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to go through that to there. <laughs> and then on the second page, yeah. uh, you, you are, this is, okay, this is my language. This is the language I'm translating into. Yeah. So there is this thing here which is before words, which is asking to be written, but it's the same thing as mm -hmm. was here, and then you find the words in this language to express that. Mm -hmm. So that if we take those two like that, mm -hmm. what happens with translation is that you have to go to the third one, mm -hmm. which is there, mm -hmm. and which is without words. So you go to this, to there, now it's no longer words, mm -hmm. but it's there, and then with this, there's no longer words you put here. Yeah. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Of course, um, we understand that. And that is a wonderful way to explain. And that leads us to another question. Um, could you tell us more about the role of love, music, poetry, painting inside anti-systemic struggles? Because we are now, for instance, the Zapatista movement is full of youngsters who are Painting yes. on the wall, uh, uh, producing yes. whatever artistic expression, and that is in certain way the core of the movement because it's so different from the all leftist marching yep. in the street, <laughs> yeah. hungry, hello, and then the body language. I mean, look at these yes. boys. Yes. Rastas, <laughs> wonderful yeah. hair, yeah. I mean, the clothing, yes. and that makes the movement different, different from other movements. I'm not saying better, I'm just saying different. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that, tell us about that. Uh, um, 
Well, I immediately think when I went to Ovenik, yes? Um, yeah? Yeah, Ovenik. Ovenik, yeah, yes. Ovenik. When I went to Ovenik, yeah, yeah. um, and I went into the school, yeah? And uh, the, the, the paintings yeah. in the school, the, the paintings around the school, yeah. were, I mean, fabulous. But, okay, it's very important because I have never, because most school buildings, let's forget about what's being taught in them. Let's just think of the place and the building. Most educational buildings in the world are institutional, with all the heaviness of that institution, mm -hmm. yes? I mean, maybe what's happening inside them is good, but yes. often it is, but I mean, the place has this terrible weight of institution, so that, oh, so that you have to... You go in, and for somewhere there's a little fear, you're, you're, mm -hmm. uh, yes? Um, whereas there, yeah, yeah. whereas there, um, the, the place, the building, was like a carnival, like a fiesta, yeah? yeah? yeah. Um, I've never seen that before. I, I've never seen an, an educational place like that. Um, so, that's an example. Images, the colour. Um, um, uh, and no, that, maybe I stop there. Um, but you ask me about poetry and, and about um, love. Um, in a way, in a, in a way, it goes back to what I said before, uh, because um, there is nothing more intimate than love, uh, and, um, but in what you are doing, uh, that very intimate aspiration, which is love, because I don't think love is just a feeling, it's an aspiration, uh, um, which incidentally, when you say, um, uh, I love you, uh, that is already something that you have received. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, it, I mean, in making, in making that statement, you are already full of a kind of plenitude, mm -hmm. if, if you mean it. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and so, th this very, very intimate aspiration, which is love, is completely connected with uh, the political, uh, uh, with collaboration, with work, uh, with with what the community is going to do together. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, um, so, like I said before, my, oh, and the and images, songs. Um, Uh, come, come somewhere from the inside, they are intimate, mm -hmm. uh, um, but they, it's not that they simply find a place in the collective, um, they, uh, they are part of it. But but I need more, more um, uh, um, Yes, I can put it another way. Um, I, in fact, um, often when when people are talking about themselves, they are talking about themselves, and this is exclusive. Okay, what, what's happened to them comes from the world, but now they're talking about themselves, and it is exclusive. 
What I'm talking about with what I've seen uh, of what you're doing, when you're talking about yourself or when you are, uh, no, not when you're talking, yeah, when you're talking about yourself, but when you are bringing things out of yourself, like words or like, like images or like colors, they are inclusive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very neat difference. And there is in your book, that book that is called Con la Esperanza Entre los Dientes. Yes. It, it was very important for us to find that the seventh chapter of that book is fear. Let's, about, let's talk about fear because number seven was from the beginning of the colloquium mentioned by the subcomandante and is part of the cosmology of the Maya world then it's not, I think it's not just by chance that the seventh chapter of your book is about fear. Tell us about that concept, that feeling, what it represents for you in your own cosmovision, in your imagination, in your work, in your life. Fear. Okay, I, I mean, I un try to answer that in, in two ways. Um, let's move a tiny bit from fear um, to pain. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, uh, fear begins very, very close to pain. Yes? I mean, it's, uh, it, um, it, it is, it is the, yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, in fact, fear is a reaction to either to pain or to imagined pain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it seems to me that uh, if we're really to understand uh, why we're in this world uh, and how, uh, we first, first of all actually have to uh, come to terms with the fact uh, that life is absolutely inseparable from pain. Um, and it's by no coincidence that uh, a newborn baby cries. Um, no, not he doesn't or she doesn't laugh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a sense, this recognition that pain is one of the conditions of life um, is very, very important because uh, it can lead to immediately uh, the desire or the impulse, the impulse to share that pain, um, to share one's own pain or to share the pain of the other. Uh, um, to recognize the pain of the other um, and, and together to recognize the pain of life. Um, and this is not at all negative hmm. uh, um, because it is in recognizing that amongst other things that one finds courage and one finds the ability uh, to resist pain yeah. um, or, or, or uh, the, the ability uh, not only to resist pain but to risk pain. Um, uh, to take the risk of, of being hurt, yes? Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, you, you tell me, but it seems to me that um, you would all agree with what I've just said. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Oh, of course, of course. Um, 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 but uh, if you say that, uh, it, uh, the in, in the thinking of the centralized systems coming from the Enlightenment and so on, no one understands what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 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 yeah. ex except poets. 
Exactly. Uh, and, and if one is, wants to talk about pain also, I mean, immediately, I mean, I think of uh, Vallejo, who's a poet that I've read for so many years and admire immensely. But you also cite Thomas Benjamin. Um, Benjamin. Val Walter Benjamin. Ba Wal Walter, Walter Benjamin. Benjamin. Walter Benjamin. Yes, well, yes. Because he, when he was a uh, philosopher, poet, who was very um, important to me. Um, and actually, one of his most important insights, it's a very good question, because one of his most important insights was that uh, if we accept history, yeah. uh, um, and if we realize that, that uh, uh, we have the capacity to make history, um, one of the most important tasks that we have is to redeem the pain of the past. Um, um, to, um, that is to say, to, to first of all, not to forget it, never to forget it. Uh, um, secondly, to give it a sense, because one of the terrible things about pain is that it, it it borders on the notion of absurdity, of the absurd. Uh, um, um, so to give it a sense, to remember it, to give it a, a, a sense, to, to be in solidarity with it. I mean, this is one of the most important principles in, in Benjamin's thinking about history. Um, um, but when you see all these violent acts like in, uh, against the Palestinian people, against the Zapatistas well, and, and people... What, what risk is so, so uh, at risk at this moment, yeah. um, which is why it's so important that we have this colloquium. Uh, yeah. um, but, I mean, that's not enough. I mean, um, and, but, I mean, the world has to know about what is probably going to happen, or which is very likely to happen very soon. Yeah, that is exactly. And um, then in that way, when you work with all these movements that trying to keep their memory and really trying to have a voice in the world, how do you feel inside, apart from your own pain? Because in certain way you are here uh, in solidarity with that pain in order to redeem the past and to help us or to be shoulder to shoulder with us. No, help Help is not a good word. No, sorry, no, but no, no, that's no. not no, correct. Uh, shoulder to shoulder. Yes. And yes, yes, yeah, yes. that is, I mean, your attitude is not uh, coming here to illuminate us and we really thank you for that because... Uh, nor is it philanthropy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, when you see all these anti-systemic movements around and you going from one painful area to the next one, inside you, what is coming out after all this? Inside you, I mean, as again, this basic reaction in the intimate level that is not uh, separate from the public life that you have. Well, let's, let's, let's just go back one moment because yeah. Because I was talking about pain, yeah. and we talked about that, but we can't stop there because we also have to recognize that life is also joy. Uh, 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 this is extremely important. Um, and um, um, when the Sukhumandanti said in one of his speeches, um, if there's no if there's no dancing in the revolution, the revolution is not for me, or not for us. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that's an expression of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and life is also a gift, an incredible gift, uh, um, despite the pain. It is so important that, um, and and you can you can sense that gift 
well, in many ways. I mean, you can sense it by what happens between between people, what they do, what they make, what they sacrifice for. But you can also see it if you really start looking just at a flower. Uh, uh, that's uh, that, that, and if you really, really look at the flower, not just our heart there, really look at it. Look at the incredible intricacy with which it is made. Uh, it, it's incredible correspondences with what is around it. Uh, it. The thrust of its energy to grow and to find the light. Uh, it, uh, its colors, uh, um, which are there for all kinds of reasons, but um, um, and the, w the, the way that uh, that the red of a flower is already there in just one seed of that flower. <coughs> I mean, if that isn't a gift, uh, and if in that sense, if the earth and life on it is not a gift, we're crazy and we're blind. But of course, what is happening in the world is that uh, um, none of that is any longer recognized because the only thing which matters is a commodity. And a commodity is the exact opposite of a gift. Mm -hmm. A commodity is something which is made to be bought, mm -hmm. um, and it's mm -hmm. made to be bought in order to, to make endless, limitless profit uh, uh, um, with what is paid for uh, to have that commodity. So gift and commodity are totally apart. Um, okay. Um, so that I'm, I'm talking about joy as well as pain. Mm -hmm. um, then, then uh, you ask me, uh, what do I feel? Um, uh, I um, okay. Yes. I can answer that. Um, first of all, I, fe I feel, I felt being here, uh, the incredible presence of your dead. Um, and I don't only mean those, those who died in your struggle, uh, but I mean just the centuries, centuries and centuries. The dead are here. They, they are contemporary with us. Um, uh, and I... Um, but equally, uh, I feel uh, this capacity, absolutely spontaneous, that you have uh, for pleasure, for joy, mm. and, for, and, for, and, for, and for sharing that. Um, um, and um, maybe there I can say something and make a comparison with Palestine, yeah. which, which I know better. Um, and it's interesting, this. It's what you don't expect until you go there. Because, I mean, you, before you go, you know, you know that every day they are harassed. Every day they don't know what's going to happen in the next four hours. They never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You say you go and see your mother who lives five kilometers away tomorrow, and it's quite likely you can't go. Uh, not, not, not to mention, but I'm talking about daily life. Um, I mean, there is no certainty, there is no continuity. Um, so you would expect people to be very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, it is in Israel that everybody is nervous all the time. Mm. Uh, when you go there, and there is a moment, okay, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or what may happen tonight, but here now we're sitting in two chairs and we're talking, and uh, um, uh, okay, let's really take this moment. This is a moment of life. Um, let, us, let us really um, concentrate upon it. Um, let, I, let us give ourselves to this moment. Um, it, it happens, and that means very calmly, because, because if one really gives oneself to this moment, which is a good moment, one is calm. Uh, 
It's almost as though that moment is eternal. Mm. Even though uh, it, it, that doesn't last very long. Uh, and that feeling that I have frequently there, um, I feel also amongst you. Uh, or I have felt sometimes amongst you. Um, and, and just as in Israel, everybody is, is nervous. Hmm? Um, okay, just go back to a moment. Also part of that calm, that willingness to, okay, accept this moment, comes from a deep knowledge that the cause you are defending or, or the cause that you are making is just. Uh, uh, it, it has no lies about it. It, 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 it is just. That, that gives the soul a great deal of calm, as it also gives it an incredible amount of courage at other moments. I, yeah, I mean, that leads us to the, one of the ideas you mentioned at the end of your talk, when you refer to hope as part of, your, of the soul, an expectation, something material, that is, it could be in the body, but not in the soul. And that meaning of hope in the way you express, it was so well received for the audience. Because expectations, I mean, people, people have expectations, but there are not, they are not enough. No. Hope is what moves all of us. Yes. And these anti-systemic movements are full of hope. They are building hope, they believe, they make, they create, and hope is what really drag us. Yes. And it's very important, that concept, and you were always telling us about this hope. And someone could say, how is it possible to have hope if, if capitalism is killing us? It's everywhere. Then, the last word, what could you say for this audience about hope? How can you close this conversation? Um, in most of the rest of the world, and often in interviews now, um, people ask, ah, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Um, and optimism uh, and pessimism are nothing to do, now, they are nothing to do with the soul. Optimism is a calculation. So you take all the elements, uh, uh, like considering the market, and you say, yeah, okay, this is a good buy. Uh, uh, um, or it's a bad buy, yeah? Um, okay, we're now not talking about the market, we're talking about a kind of feeling, but you say, so I'm optimistic, and it is quantitative. After all those, 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 those things, okay, the prospects look good, so I'm optimistic. The prospects look pretty bad, so I'm pessimistic. Okay, optimism has nothing, or pessimism has nothing to do with hope. Uh, hope is essentially uh, like a candle flame. Um, and uh, it's perhaps at its brightest when it's dark. Mm. Uh, um, uh, um, and that doesn't mean to say um, that it is not real at all. I mean, it is, it is, it is, the, uh, it is the most real thing that we have. And of course, it is um, um, what hope does is to s offer energy. Hmm. Um, it, uh, it offers energy in two ways. Um, it gives energy to the person who is feeling it, but also it attracts the energy hmm. of those who see that in that person. Hmm. Uh, um, 
and 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 with that energy uh, we resist mm. uh, we resist what causes the darkness uh, and we, we try to diminish it um, uh, um, And in that moment of, uh, or in those acts of resistance, we have something also, those moments and those acts are also eternal. Yeah. Uh, like that moment of calm that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And when I say they, they are eternal, um, I, um, I mean, that uh, um, at that moment we are touching eternity. I'm not saying that those moments go on and on and on and on and on like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, it is. It is that at, those, at that moment eternity, which exists, enters our lives as it can always do if we, if if we behave like the philosopher Spinoza said, if we behave adequately. And, and by behaving adequately means recognizing what is around us and what is happening uh, and forgetting the self. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, it was a pleasure. It is a pleasure to talk to you and um, all your words, your attitude, your feeling, your feelings, your ideas enter in our souls, then don't forget that because we really are in communication. We are connected and it is basic in these anti-systemic movements in, in our lives too. Thank you, John Berg. No. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>